Hey everybody, it's Party Elite, and today we are finally diving in with a full review of Total War Three Kingdoms. As the next full Total War title, critical eyes have been on this game since it was first announced as the next big historical title, especially since, at the time, it felt very much like the next big fantasy game instead. Now, after a couple of delays in release, we can finally start making some judgment calls. As always, in the interest of full disclosure, you should know that Creative Assembly gave me a review key so that I'd be able to review the game before release. Naturally, this does not affect my opinion, and I think that will be very clear, especially in the latter half of this video. So hang in there. Now, if after seeing this review, you feel like picking the game up, you might want to consider doing so through my Humble Bundle affiliate link that I'll put under the eye at the top right corner of the screen and in the description down below. Buying through the link supports charity and the channel. Please keep in mind that this review is focused on the standalone game and does not include discussion about the Yellow Turban Rebellion DLC that one gets for free if buying the game within a week of its release. That I'll review separately. Like its many predecessors, Total War Three Kingdoms is split into two gameplay systems. Turn-based grand campaign gameplay where you manage your nation, recruit units, manage cities and strategize conquest, and real-time battles where you control the units and armies you've recruited and sent marching into war. Three Kingdoms takes us to the Three Kingdoms time period in China, and for the first time ever in a Total War game, we have the option of playing the game in two slightly different ways. The more grounded, records mode, or the more fantastical romance mode. While the two modes aren't extremely different, they do have some serious implications that I'll touch on in a bit. Overall, Total War Three Kingdoms tries to take some big strides for the series, but are these strides in the right direction? Let's first discuss the turn-based campaign gameplay systems that are in place. I think veterans of the series are likely to be pretty intrigued by some of the major changes taking place here. With the time period in question, players can choose to start as one of 12 Warlords, one of whom is unlocked through gameplay. These Warlords all lead their own factions, and each of these factions have some unique features and capabilities. Certain factions focus on very aggressive playstyles, while others imply a less warlike approach. Every faction has the typical Total War start, a small holding and an opening battle, followed by a mission that has you capturing a nearby settlement. After that, things open up pretty nicely. And as far as Total War campaigns go, this is by far the biggest leap forward this series has taken in a long time. We see the return of some old mechanics from the series' previous games, but we also see the fleshing out of mechanics that had stagnated real hard. Each warlord is trying to climb the faction rank ladder, and as they progress through the rungs, more functionalities get unlocked. They'll have access to more armies, more diplomatic options, etc, etc. The more interesting mechanics that are unlocked include administrative aspects, such as your council, or more nefarious aspects, such as your spy network. Climbing the ladder is done in a variety of ways, often faction-dependent, but typically revolving around growing your faction in one way or another. Conquest is the easiest way, but there are more going-tall type options as well. As you grow one way or another, you're going to have to manage your holdings. Now we're going to start a very simple conversation and just watch how it spirals out of control in the best possible way, at least in my opinion. Provinces, called commanderies in ancient China, consist of minor settlements and one major city. The minor settlements come in a variety of shapes, sizes, and purposes. Some will be iron mines, some will be farming villages, others will provide jade, etc, etc. Now these minor settlements are fairly linear in progression, though there is sometimes room for decision making as these minor settlements are upgraded, and there's also room for decision making as far as which minor settlements you might want to treat as high value targets worth attacking first or defending from the AI. The major cities are more complex. The cities themselves can and need to be upgraded to unlock more building slots and higher tier buildings, and the buildings themselves provide a variety of boons, but also issues. There is a degree of decision making when it comes to picking and choosing buildings. Some paths will give you more of a certain resource while also hurting aspects of the city, like reducing its population or public order. Sometimes the decisions are simple. All the numbers are pointing upwards, the building fulfills an immediate need, and you go for it on an impulse. At other times, you'll want to build a commandery into a commercial, industrial, trade, or military hub by planning and synchronizing the various buildings within balancing buffs and debuffs in order to make the commandery what you need it to be. On top of that, you can assign an administrator to commanderies that you control. Now these administrators provide their own benefits, and on top of that, 
you can send people on assignments in commanderies as well. Now, these assignments can help do things like reduce construction time, increase replenishment rates, modify income rates, and otherwise synergize with other decisions you've already made for the commandery in question. But who does these assignments? Who are these administrators? Well, characters in Total War Three Kingdoms are far more fleshed out than they've perhaps ever been. Apart from having traits and predispositions towards certain roles and not wanting to take on other roles, they also have skills that can be unlocked as they level up. These traits, attributes, skills, and ranks all determine the kind of benefits and assignments any character has access to, and as such, they determine where you might want to use a character. For once, you're not only caring about your generals, but about your administrators and council members too. But with characters comes managing characters and their relationships. These characters aren't just illustrations with stats attached to them. They have wants, needs, ambitions, likes, and dislikes. Now, being mindful of these factors can be extremely important as otherwise, characters might choose to stab you in the back, abandoning your faction, or kicking off a civil war if they're powerful enough. You'll want to assign them the right followers, ancillaries, weapons, armors, mounts, based on how you intend on using or appeasing them, and depending on which stats you need buffed, which stats you're okay with debuffing, and which abilities you might want to unlock. Character relationships are quite tangible elements that you can see represented in a few different ways as well, and you can actually affect these relationships in some interesting ways, whether it's events that happen over the course of your campaign, or active decisions you make, like sending two characters into battle together very often, or two characters go into battle against each other repeatedly. Now, have I, have I gone off topic? We were talking about province management, and all of a sudden we're talking about characters. Well, no. This is how intertwining these mechanics are. You might actually find yourself contemplating your decisions to a very great degree. And that's only if that's how you want to play it, though. And I haven't even touched on the effects of population, supplies, reserves, or public order. Of course, you can pay these details no mind and take on the resulting struggles as they come at you, but if you want to put yourself in the mindset of somebody actually managing a faction, you have a lot on your hands. Turns, on average, feel longer than they have in the Fantasy Total War games, and even more so than Thrones of Britannia as well. I had more decisions to make, more elements to consider, and more options to look at. Now, not every turn was that involved, but on average I was doing more per turn here, and I liked it. And I haven't even touched on diplomacy. Diplomacy is actually a thing now. This is another huge leap for Total War. The AI actively partakes in diplomatic options, sometimes a little too much perhaps, and you'll often find yourself trying to craft the perfect deal so that you get what you need. Making coalitions, forming alliances, getting vassals, offering your own subservience to superior nations, these are all very real options with very real consequences. You may have seen my Yuan Shao gameplay where I tried playing tall, it actually worked pretty well. I procured some vassals, I called on them to fight my wars, they did well enough to listen while sometimes being distracted by their own best interests, and sometimes they asked for independence, sometimes they asked for aid. Meanwhile, I've had the AI call me into a coalition as well, and I've seen AI factions treat with other AI factions as if they were real factions, signing agreements, declaring war, forming coalitions of their own. Honestly, it's a little overwhelming in the best possible way at first, just how much weight there is on diplomacy, and I was surprised to see it was actually a prominent aspect of the game. Again, if you want to ignore diplomacy, that's an option, but I like it. I like it a lot. Now, with all that said, the campaign gameplay isn't all sunshine and rainbows. Some aspects fall a little flat. The tech tree is probably the most beautiful tech tree I've ever seen in any video game ever, but the fact that it's the same across the board is a little disappointing. Branded as reforms, they imply cultural and political progress rather than technological progress, and they unlock buildings and units as well as various buffs. Depending on your faction and playstyle, you'll likely make different decisions, but I wish there was more variety here between factions. I suppose, historically speaking, there's bound to be some sameness on this front. The family tree is pretty plain as well. It gives options for arranging marriages, adopting people, and caring for your line of succession, but it isn't anything worth writing home about, really. The court is an interesting idea, and the fact that you can call on it to give you missions is a nice thought, but the missions themselves are fairly one-dimensional. And another disappointment, and I think this is purely based on the RNG here, was the spy system. On paper, it sounds great. In multiplayer, 
it's almost definitely amazing because you can play co-op or head-to-head -head multiplayer with two players in the campaign and I can just imagine using spies against each other, tricking each other, sounds amazing because what you can do is you can send somebody out into the world to spy for you and they can end up integrated into your enemy's faction should they get hired. They might end up as generals, as administrators, or even as an heir. And you can activate them whenever you deem fit, potentially stealing an army, triggering a civil war, etc. etc. It all depends on where that character and that spy of yours ended up. But they could get caught as well, and then they might be sent back to you, and they might be spying. Like on, again, on paper, that sounds amazing. But in reality, when I tried using it, I didn't have much luck. Most of the time, my spies would go out there, they'd spot a couple of cities, they wouldn't get hired, and then they'd return as a failure, as far as I'm concerned. So, a little unfortunate. I didn't really get to see all of this cool stuff play out, so take my opinion on that with a grain of salt. However, I do think, especially in multiplayer, the whole spy angle really changes things up. So that's uh, pretty cool, I think. Now, I'm also not a fan of how units and armies work. Let me be clear, I like the recruitment system where a unit musters to full strength over time. That part is fine. But the whole retinue system just feels a little clunky. I couldn't really get myself to care for the supposed synergies between the generals and their troops, and the multi-tiered unit unlocking mechanisms just made me want to stop caring about higher tier units. I get that certain general types have access to certain unique units, but I felt that this system was both limiting and also not. On the one hand, I could still recruit all the baseline units, and on the other, I often ended up with armies that weren't really what I wanted them to be. I felt like I couldn't really craft my armies, and as such, I immediately lost a sense of ownership over the armies. Anybody who watches this channel's Let's Plays, especially in Total War, they know that I grow very attached to units, often keeping Tier 1 units until they die, even if that's the final battle of a campaign. Here, I could not care less about these people. They were literally just unit cards to me. And I think this feeds into the next part of the review. Real-time battles are a crucial part of any true Total War gaming experience. And with Three Kingdoms, I unfortunately just simply could not get into them, and I'd go so far as to say they aren't great. I think the extreme unit sizes are great, though not every computer will be able to handle them, and honestly some cities aren't even designed with that unit scale in mind, which is a big miss. In Wreckers mode, generals are just regular general units, and I think that works well. I'm not personally the biggest fan of the romance mode over the top generals. Uh, they're fun enough to play with, uh, but they are a little too powerful in my opinion, and they take away some of the elements of Total War that I like most, particularly in historical games. I think people who enjoy the over-the-top approach will like them, because I did enjoy them when I approached Three Kingdoms with a fantasy mindset, but I wanted the big historical release, and so I was definitely preferring the records mode overall as a personal preference. I like the weight of fatigue in records mode, and the slower paced battles were nice. We're not talking ridiculously long battles, but a good 20 minute battle every now and then was definitely a nice change of pace with an average of 10 or so minutes in length. Also in either mode, I thought the limited ammunition for archers was a nice touch. It meant they had to have an appropriate general in charge of them to ensure they had more ammo so they would actually be helpful throughout a battle. Something that I sometimes cared for, but you know, not enough, I don't think. There were aspects to the battles that I was fully on board with, and yet the experience as a whole felt lackluster. The unit info is really incoherent, and while I like having more information at my fingertips, when it came to comparing units, I just couldn't be bothered with trying to wrap my head around what I was seeing, which is kind of a big deal when it comes to figuring out how to use your units. Duels, only available in romance mode between characters, are okay. They get repetitive pretty quickly, and more often than not, nobody is even willing to duel you unless they're likely to win, in which case, you'll want to decline the challenges that you'll inevitably get. The fighting itself looks acceptable, is the word I'll go with, and the battle AI is just still not where it needs to be. Cavalry should not be sitting there looking pretty as arrows fly into the various body parts. AI should not be sending all of their units through one entrance in a siege battle. AI units should not clump to get rear charged freely. AI units should not be leaving archers completely unprotected. AI units should not be running back and forth, exposing their backs to archer fire. Even when I was playing multiplayer battles, the army creation screens seemed needlessly overwhelming, having you pick generals that you could set at a specific level to unlock certain units and abilities, and each general had a retinue, and each retinue had access to some units or not depending on the general in charge. It all makes sense in the systems of the game, but I think the systems are maybe needlessly overcomplicated for no real positive outcome. 
I never felt excited or even interested in synergizing troops to generals, and I certainly didn't feel like it made a real difference. As far as the campaign was concerned, I found myself wanting to auto-resolve as many battles as possible. They simply did not catch my attention, despite me almost always enjoying historical Total War battles. I think they're epic, I think they're cool, I'm not being tainted by Total War Warhammer battles or anything, I just feel like these missed the mark. I think it was the needless complexities that added nothing to the game, and some crucial UI and UX mistakes, coupled with the relative sea of sameness that is the result of a monocultural unit roster. I'm actually really sad about this because I love Total War Battles and I just can't get into them here. Now I touched on UI and UX moments ago, so let's quickly talk about the overall audiovisual situation here. I think it's pretty interesting and cool that the game has quite a few options so players can customize things a little. Apart from accessibility options and typical graphics options and UI scaling, the game also comes with a couple of color treatments and UI modifications. From an audio perspective, you can flip between English and Mandarin at a somewhat granular level, and I think that's pretty neat because while I want my advisor speaking to me in English, I'd like my units and generals to speak Mandarin, and I can do that. From a visual perspective, there are a few more options. The color treatments can be flipped between Romance and Attila, so you either opt for the vibrant, super-saturated look, or you go for the grittier, more desaturated look. The mode you actually play the game in doesn't matter, because the graphics option they're both available for either game mode. Either looks good as far as color treatments are concerned, this really boils down to personal preference, I think. We also have options for the unit markers on the battlefield. When you drag units out, you can either see the new approach that many of us complained about when we first saw it, or the classic approach that shows unit density by separating entities into pips. Unit cards can also be one of two ways, either the style we saw with all the marketing that, in my opinion, is hard to read, and the other option is a lot easier to read, but unfortunately not really stylized in any way. I liked the unit cards of Rome 2 and Thrones of Britannia, so this feels like a missed opportunity, but I am glad that at least there's an option here. I wish there was some kind of option for the unit icons in battle as well. I'm not a fan of the bright green and red circles, and they feel like a step back from Warhammer. There's also a major issue from a UX perspective. While the game has a pretty user interface outside of the issues I pointed out, the actual communication of information is often confusing and unclear, leading to increased complications. Clear cues and relationships are often not highlighted, and even contrast issues plague certain parts of the game. While the tech tree unfurling the first time is really pretty, it takes forever and gets annoying pretty quick. Thankfully, that one's easy to fix, with a quick hotfix, I think. Apart from all that, I think the game is really pretty. The UI is drop-dead gorgeous, and the music is outstanding. No complaints on either of those fronts. I also like that the historical battles, that there are a few of, uh, have this really cool introductory cinematic to all of them. I'm personally a big fan of the cool camera moves and the storytelling that they're taking advantage of over here, so big fan of those. And I'm also personally a fan of the tilt-shift depth of field effect, though I do feel it can be a bit much at times. And I also like the fact that the anti-aliasing tech being used here is amazing. There's like no jaggies, foliage looks gorgeous, and little details are crisp. Lighting is spot on, though the campaign map can be a bit hard to read in the night lighting. And I think the biggest visual issue, though, comes with the battle animations. Some are great, like cavalry charges or cavalry collapsing under ranged fire, but typically there's a lot of slipping and sliding involved and a lot of looking around involved. Especially when one general is chasing another in romance mode. I don't often play battles fully zoomed in, but the occasional time I zoomed in here, it was pretty, but nothing stellar, unfortunately. I do like that the equipment on your general actually changes based on the equipment you've assigned them in the campaign. That's a must-have, in my opinion. So overall, the visuals are a bit of a mixed bag. I'm happy with how the game looked and felt overall. Like the brushwork motifs were employed nicely, and they translated well in the campaign map. The character art is gorgeous, and even the building icons, in my opinion, are quite nice. Uh, the unit icons feel lackluster in either option, and there are some confusing elements at times, so it's really a mixed bag, like I said. Now, some really big problems that transcend Three Kingdoms and speak to bigger issues beyond the game itself. Uh, getting Day 1 DLC for free as an early adopter bonus is not an acceptable move, in my opinion, under any circumstances that come to mind. In fact, the more comprehensive the Day 1 DLC is, the worse the deed, I think. Many defend the move, after all, you're getting paid content for free, but the reality is that a part of the product that had resources dedicated to it is getting locked behind a paywall. It's an inconsiderate move for anybody who can't pre-order the game or get it within the first week, and it diverts resources away from the full price game during production. 
I haven't liked non-cosmetic pre-order bonuses since digital bonuses became a thing. As for the quality of the DLC itself, I'll talk about that in a separate review. Now anybody who frequents this channel's reviews knows that I'm not one for numerical scores. I find them arbitrary, resulting in comparisons between games that often don't make any sense. Instead, I try to encapsulate the overall feeling of the game and whether it was fun to play or not. And this is a weird one. After a few delays that I think did a lot in favor of the game, we have a surprising end product. I cannot get enough of the campaign gameplay. I literally think about the campaigns when I'm not playing the game. They're a ton of fun. Some absolutely huge strides have been made, and there's actually some variety to be found again. It's not just stringing together battles or making minor decisions every once in a while. But the battles themselves felt lackluster, needlessly complicated to no benefit, and in fact taking steps backwards compared to the campaign. I feel like there was such a focus on improving campaign gameplay this time around that the battles took a bit of a hit. Risks were taken, and they aren't paying off, but you can't score if you don't shoot, I guess. Plus, the fact that we're still seeing some AI issues that have existed for many games in a row now is disappointing. I think, for those looking to focus on the battle gameplay, this might be a bit of a letdown, unfortunately. But if you're really into the in-depth campaign gameplay, I genuinely believe you're in for a treat as you manage all of these intricate, intertwined mechanics. I'm definitely surprised by the end product, I just don't know if that's a good thing. I hope you find this review helpful in your decision-making process, and if you have any questions or thoughts of your own, I'll happily be looking through all the comments down below. As I mentioned, I'll be including a Humble Bundle link if you'd like to support the channel and charity if you purchase the game, and remember to subscribe to this channel for more reviews, previews, let's plays, and strategy gaming content in general. A massive thanks goes out to all the channel members and patrons who support this channel on a monthly basis, keeping us alive and running smoothly, and a big thanks goes out to all of you for watching. Until next time, cheers.